Welcome to episode 67 of the Headspace and Timing Podcast, a show brought to you by the Change Your POV Podcast Network. On today's show, I have a conversation with Kevin Snyder, a defense attorney working with Justice Involved Veterans. This conversation is near and dear to my heart as I've been working with Justice Involved Veterans in a clinical capacity since 2014. Here's a quick preview of what you'll hear on the episode. Then we'll hear a quick word from my buddy, Bennett Tanton, about one of the network sponsors, and then we'll get into the show. The goal of the court is to, in the end, uh, help rehabilitate the veteran and have them succeed moving forward. In order to do that, uh, veteran uh, treatment courts will provide some incentives such as reduction in offenses or there, there could be a, an early exp- expungement or a dismissal of charges so that uh, the incident, the criminal case doesn't hang over the veteran's head and disadvantage them um, you know, the rest of their life. And, and the idea is uh, because of their service, uh, they have gotten to this point in their life that has led to an offense. And if we're able to address some of their needs as a result of their service, then they're less likely to reoffend. Today's sponsor is Shopify. Whether you sell online, on social media, in store, or out of the trunk of your car, Shopify has you covered, no design skills needed. Establish your brand online with a custom domain name and online store with instant access to hundreds of the best looking themes and complete control over the look and feel, you finally have a gorgeous store of your own that reflects the personality of your business. We use Shopify here at Change Your POV Podcast Network and we highly recommend it. Get straight to growing your business. Let them handle the rest. Go to changeyourpov.com forward slash resources to claim your 14 day free trial. Again, Go to changerpov.com forward slash resources to claim your 14 day free trial. Welcome to the Change Your POV Podcast Network. You're listening to Headspace and Timing, a show dedicated to breaking down the stereotypes about veteran mental health. My name is Dwayne France, and I'm a combat veteran of both Iraq and Afghanistan. After I retired from the Army, I took on a new mission as a clinical mental health counselor for my fellow service members. If you served in any branch of the military, you're familiar with the M2 machine gun, the 50 cal. It's one of the most effective weapons in the military's arsenal. If the weapon's headspace and timing wasn't set right, however, it was just a huge useless chunk of metal. Veterans can be rendered inoperable if their headspace and timing isn't set correctly either. That's my goal with this show, to change the way that we think and talk about veteran mental health and reduce the stigma against seeking support. Each week, we'll talk with mental health professionals, veterans, and those who support veteran service members and their families. We're going to have real and honest conversations about a topic that most just don't like to talk about, veteran mental health. Let's jump into this week's conversation. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Headspace and Timing Podcast. Once again, and as always, we really appreciate you taking the time to listen and learn about veteran mental health uh, and uh, and the fact that you're listening to us now means that you care about this subject uh, in one way shape or form uh, so uh, you know as always uh, we do have some uh, guests who are mental health professionals we have some guests who are veterans uh, and we have some individuals who are working with programs or supporting veterans uh, this show really falls into that third category our guest for today is uh, Kevin Snyder, and we're going to be talking about a subject that's near and dear to my heart, uh, which is uh, veterans in the criminal justice system uh, and veteran courts. So uh, before we get into that, Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, having me on the show, Dwayne. It's nice to be a part of something so great. And I'm happy to be here to talk about uh, veterans treatment courts and a variety of other sentencing alternatives in California. Uh, I've been a practicing attorney for over 12 years now, and I first was introduced to military and veteran representation through the Orange County Public Defender's Office. And I have had the privilege of working with veterans uh, almost exclusively since 2012. I'm now in private practice uh, in Irvine, California, and part of my practice still 
is to represent active military service members and veterans that become criminally justice involved. And uh, and so and we have talked before. You and I uh, talked uh, for at length, really, again about a subject that we're both uh, passionate about. Uh, but you're not a veteran, um, and and you, like you said, you came to uh, veterans courts through your work in the in the criminal justice system. Um, and we talked a little bit before about what interested you about this work. So could you go into that a little bit? Uh, absolutely, Dwayne. That, that's right. I get asked the question a lot. Uh, and, and I'm not surprised. There are a lot of great attorneys out there that have served, that are veterans, that are doing great work. And it's a, a product of their experience. Uh, for me, it, it has been uh, not because I, I served. Um, I, I grew up uh, before 9-11. I had wanted to, to serve, but certain life uh, events occurred, and, and that just didn't happen. And, but I went to school with a number of people that I graduated in 2001. So we graduated that spring, and then September 9-11 came, and a number of uh, people that I went to school with were in ROTC programs, and they went uh, over to Iraq. And I remember hearing firsthand those accounts from my friends my, and my colleagues in, sc- in school, what they were going through and what they went through when they came home. And I always felt really indebted uh, to them for what they had uh, given and, I, and something that I wanted to give, but, but I didn't. And I moved on and to do other things. And this was an opportunity that I had to turn around and assist uh, you know, in some situations, an actual friend, but an extension, uh, a network of people that serve to protect my ability to pursue other dreams that I have and allow uh, protections to be in place. I felt very strongly and moved uh, to do that. So uh, when I was at the public defender's office and I was given this opportunity to work in the veterans treatment court there, it all came full circle for me. And it really just clicked and made a a lot of sense. Uh, Something finally I was able to do to give back to such a well-deserving group of people that had stood the post for me and allowed me to, uh, uh, to get to where I was. And I was so very thankful. So it's my way of giving back uh, to the veteran community and doing this type of work uh, is what moves me to do it, really. Now, had you heard about veterans courts before you got into the public defender's office? I mean, was this, uh, and and this is even off of my own experience, before I got involved in veterans courts, I didn't even realize it was a thing. So were you aware of it before that? Before I started working at the public defender's office, no. Um, uh, It was... They didn't have something uh, similar in the federal system. Um, I had in law school, had some internships at the Federal Public Defender's Office in LA and then Richmond, Virginia. They don't have a a similar program there, so it wasn't familiar. Uh, But I entered the Public Defender's Office pretty much uh, after I uh, got out of law school. So in in Orange County, they began that uh, Veterans Treatment Court in 2008. So, and in, in, I began working there in 2006. So, pretty much uh, from the nearly the get go, uh, I became more familiar. But if you're not working in the veterans treatment court, it's still something foreign to you. So, while countywide, our office was aware of the its courts naturally. If you're not staffed in that court, it, it's still something that's unknown. What does it uh, really do? Who's it really for? Who does it really benefit? Uh, I didn't really get a full picture of that until I started working there in 2012. Yeah, so, and in, uh, in this may be a good time for us to give a little bit of an overview of what veteran courts are. And listeners, uh, longtime listeners know that this is uh, primarily um, the population that I've worked with uh, since 2014 as a mental health counselor uh, is justice-involved veterans. And uh, so the first courts um, started out uh, 2008, um, there's a little bit of, one started in Alaska, but, but the, the stake was really put in Buffalo, New York was the first one. Uh, and then a couple, uh, really followed through very quickly. Uh, like you said, Orange County started in 2008. Ours here in El Paso County in Colorado started early 2009. And it was one of the first ones in, uh, in Colorado. It was the first one in Colorado. So, um, could you give us just a little bit of an overview of what a veteran treatment court is from your standpoint? Sure. And it's changed over the years, obviously, since they first began. And there's been more education um, about veterans, their needs. Uh, there's been more 
education within the, the criminal justice system uh, about what they uh, what those needs are, so uh, what would be allowed. But at the basic level, it, it's a collaborative court. And what that means is that the stakeholders in any criminal case come to the table to work together for the, the rehabilitative benefit of the veteran who is a defendant in uh, in a matter you know pending through the criminal courts. So who are those stakeholders? One is the court system itself, the judiciary, who's the, the neutral arbitrator in any criminal case. You have the prosecutor who files the charges. And then, of course, the defense attorney uh, who's defending the person charged. Uh, and in this particular situation, uh, there's also probation and um, county mental health that are also other stakeholders when we're talking about the collaborative efforts. Um, individuals that uh, are not sent to prison are placed on something called probation, where you have a person called a probation officer that watches over you, that you report to, that you check in with. Uh, their, their goal and mission is to make sure that you stay on track uh, so that you can uh, rehabilitate and not reoffend. And then, of course, if you need other services, uh, behavioral health, uh, our mental health services, uh, uh, at least our county and a lot of different counties across the country have uh, mental health um, services. So uh, these are the stakeholders that uh, sit in the court. And unlike a normal court uh, in a criminal justice system that's adversarial, the parties are all working together. And any different type of case, they would be uh, at odds and fighting against each other. That's how the system is set up as an adversarial system. But here, they are coming together and working together. There is a more free flow of information about the veteran, what their needs are. Uh, and the goal of the court is to, in the end, uh, help rehabilitate the veteran and have them succeed moving forward. In order to do that, uh, veteran uh, treatment courts will provide some incentives such as reduction in offenses or um, there there could be a, an early exp expungement or a dismissal of charges so that uh, the incident, the criminal case doesn't hang over the veteran's head and disadvantage them um, you know, the rest of their life. When And, and the idea is uh, because of their service, uh, they have gotten to this point in their life that has led to an offense. And if we're able to address some of their needs as a result of their service, then they're less likely to reoffend. Um, and so, and there are other courts uh, in Orange County, we have a number of different other uh, types of collaborative courts like this that focus on different um, segments of, of defendants, different defendants' needs. We have different mental health courts. Uh, DUI courts and drug courts. It's a similar model uh, as a, a drug court and its collaborative nature. Yeah, and I think that uh, the this is actually modeled off of the drug court uh, um, platform, which has really been around since the mid-90s, and it's, and it's a way to um, help individuals get into mental health treatment or get into substance abuse treatment with the drug courts. Um, and, and what I've seen in, in working with this, it's usually... Uh, as you said, something in the veteran's service caused their behavior to change and they found themselves in the back of a cop car and sitting in front of a judge at some point. Um, what I guess we typically see here in Colorado, and, and, and this is, I guess, one thing is that uh, each of the jurisdictions are very unique. We've got five uh, courts here in Colorado and, and the makeup of the courts are very unique, and each, each community is very unique with its resources and things like that. Um, but what Absolutely. I see is, right, you know, and so um, in what I see with veterans is um, typically four different kind of uh, offenses that they find themselves in. DUIs, of course, um, those who are in the military know that that is a longstanding challenge even uh, on active duty. Um, domestic violence, but situational domestic violence, not necessarily prolonged battery uh, and, and severe uh, abuse, but uh, uh, things like um, a veteran, male or female, um, you know, not being able to control or manage their emotions and getting into a physical or, or a highly combative verbal altercation with their significant other. Um, 
what I call the take this plane to Cuba charge. I'm going to wave a gun around in the air and, and, you know, just menace somebody. Right. You know, and, and I mean, and, and so, and this is a challenge, I think with a lot of veterans, um, and then, uh, bar fights, assaults, uh, those kind of things. Those, those, I guess, are the generally four different kind of charges that I see in our courts, um, that, a veteran sometimes, and I would even say probably majority of the time, substances are involved, so alcohol-fueled kind of things. Um, so those are the kind of things we're seeing that that we see with our veterans in our courts. Do you see something similar with your veterans? Yes, we do. And the only other one that I'd add there is you know just general uh, substance abuse um, related offense would be possession, possession of a variety of, uh, of different uh, controlled substances. Sometimes that bleeds over to possession for sales, whether they're actually selling or not, but that's what they're charged with um, because of the uh, amounts that they're they're possessing or uh, a vari- whatever variety of uh, prescription medication they might be possessing. Depend- uh, depending on the, the prosecutors reviewing the case, they might file that as a drug sales case, for for example, and, I, and I've seen that. I've seen cases where uh, the veteran is, you know, it's not just based on a assumption due to um, the amounts possessed. <clears throat> they, you know, there's other evidence that that may show or admissions that they, they are selling, uh, and that's the means by which they're surviving um, uh, out in the street. So, it, again, but it's all wrapped up together with substance abuse and uh, mental health challenges, I think, touches on each and every one of those uh, different sections that you mentioned, uh, and then including this one. Right. And, and, and obviously, um, that's one of the reasons for the court's existence is to help a veteran get the treatment that um, that could have prevented this in the first place. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate that you brought that up, and even the prescriptions, and, and you're exactly right. I, I did leave that out. Um, the uh, the opioid epidemic that veterans are experiencing started in the DOD um, whenever we were given the pain pills and, and fentanyl lollipops and all these kind of things. Uh, and so when a veteran is no longer to able to manage their chronic pain, for example, they'll turn to prescription drug abuse or even street drugs or things like that. And so, uh, yes, those kind of uh, charges um, are the ones that I I also see uh, veterans coming into the court. Uh, what I find unique, though, is, is most veterans are not, they didn't grow up in this environment. You know, when, when they mm-hmm. raised their right hand to join the military, they never anticipated that they would be standing in front of the judge. Um, this isn't something that uh, maybe someone from a different population who grew up in this uh, Um, in this environment says, you know, sooner or later, I'm going to be on the wrong side of the law. Um, For veterans, that's not the case. And it's really a shock to their, their system, whenever they find themselves sitting in the back of a cop car. Exactly right. Um, I I think that across the board, um, I can't think of a a client that I've represented, a a veteran client, all these years that had uh, grown up in this, that environment. Um, you know, there certainly are those examples, of course, but I, I think that they are fewer and farther between, um, that this is an alternate lifestyle for them. This is not what life was before they entered the military. Um, and in fact, maybe with the exception of perhaps um, a couple of clients that may have had some DUIs prior or while they were in service, uh, typically speaking, uh, the veterans that I've come into contact with have squeaky clean records. Naturally, they have to um, in order uh, to get into the military by and large. And certainly while they're in the military, if something comes up, they, they can be discharged for that. So you, you have somebody who is now criminally justice involved um, who is leading this completely alternate through the looking glass uh, lifestyle. And it's difficult for them from a management perspective just – uh, you know, when they uh, are sober, for example, um, to wrap their brain around what the heck happened. Right. And, and I, I see the same thing. Uh, you know, their, their heads are spinning. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of shame uh, personally uh, that I see again with with the veterans that I work with when they're standing there in front of the judge. Um, they they don't want to be there, not because 
most of them take responsibility for what they did. Yes, I, I did it. Yes, I, it happened. But there's a lot of shame around being involved in the criminal justice system uh, that, like you said, they, they never anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's a, it's a challenge for veterans to be in the system, in this kind of system, um, sort of even to begin with. Uh, but then what I found is, is you had mentioned earlier that this is a very supportive kind of court. You know, everybody thinks court is the jury of the peers and things like that. Um, you know, this isn't law and order, right? This isn't what we see on TV or, or anything like that. Um, it, it really is, as you said, a collaborative effort to come around and help the veteran get the treatment they need um, after these incidents, which uh, maybe if they got it before these incidents, it might have been prevented. It, it, exactly right. And that's the whole point of, of the court. And when it's uh, working well, it works to that effect. But as, as you also mentioned, that Every county is different. Every state is different. Uh, and it, depending on where you are and who is working in those courts, it may be more of a supportive court in certain places than others. Um, but the bottom line is the purpose and the intent is for it to be a supportive environment. And I think that uh, it, it's definitely what we see in our courts here in Colorado and what I've heard from courts around the nation. I've literally heard um, that, that this is life-changing. Um, but one of the unique aspects is that, and we went through a little earlier about all those different charges, um, if someone were not a veteran, um, th those would be different courts that they would be involved in, right? So if it was multiple DUIs, they'd be in DUI court. If it was domestic violence, they'd be in DV court. If it was substances, they'd be in, um, you know, a, a drug court, for example. However, the complicated aspect of, of the veterans, and, and if you put trauma, n not only combat trauma, but, but majority combat trauma from what I'm seeing, once you put that in the mix, you have all of these other behaviors, and it, and it gets really complicated, um, and it takes a special program, really, to be able to manage all that. Exactly. It's because it's the shared experience. Um, you. Usually those courts, uh, like you, you were mentioning, DUI courts, uh, domestic violence court, drug courts, uh, they, they're open to a variety of, of civilians, non-military, uh, that if you put a veteran in, the, in those courts, they, they could um, go through it successfully, um, but they're not going to necessarily have all of their needs met. Uh, because there is an underlying um, need for an understanding of the military experience, the mindset going into the military, um, and the actual experience of serving, whether you're serving in combat or you're not in combat, uh, what, what that is like, uh, because that is connected to uh, the, the service needs, the, me the mental health uh, needs of the veteran. And if you don't have that understanding or you're in mixed company, you're not going to have that support even from your peers. I think one powerful thing about the court is that you have your peers there as part of the support. And I didn't mention that before because um, as far as they're not stakeholders as service providers, but it is a powerful aspect of the court that you turn to your right, you turn to your left, you have other uh, generally guys, and we can talk about that in the course of the conversation too, about female uh, veterans and, and their needs and some of the things that have uh, been adjusted and there's movements moving forward. But uh, you, you have uh, you know, people that, are, that served in the same branch of the military, uh, which is even more support, or even if they didn't, they have had a similar military experience. Maybe they they were stationed um, in a, a similar country, a similar time period. Uh, you have that uh, affinity and that bond together, so you're not feeling all alone, which is uh, tends to be, at least in, in the experience that I've had rep representing uh, veterans, is that they feel isolated because uh, right. they're no longer part of that core an anymore. They're, they're on the outside, and that's part of the big challenge. And they're going home to uh, other people and family members that just aren't getting them and here's a group of people that get them, uh, and it's the, it's their peers. Yes, there maybe there's the judge uh, has had military service. Sometimes that's the case, or other stakeholders have military service. Uh, but what's truly powerful is that they have that camaraderie there that you just you can't get and replicate 
in the other courts. Right, and, and I'm glad that you brought that up, and I, I want to make it uh, clear for the listeners, uh, when you're talking about peers, it's not just other guys going through the program. Um, it's actual members of the court who are peer mentors, peer support specialists, veteran mentors, whatever they call them, but they're not people going through the court. They're part of, of whatever the program is, um, and they're there to, to support the veteran. So in, in, uh, and I usually group this in, in a couple of different uh, uh, aspects. As you said, you have the, the court side uh, with the judicial officers, uh, and then you have the community support side, uh, which for us is community providers, but we also have the peer support specialists. They work uh, a lot like case managers, right? They're not therapists. They're not mental health professionals. Uh, but listeners will, uh, will know that uh, uh, back at the beginning of January, you had Bennett Tanton on the show as a peer mentor. The VA has gone to a peer mentor in, in some different positions. And one of the unique aspects of the court is that um, the peer mentors are there to be able to provide that support uh, for the veterans as, as they go through the program. And I've seen that be as critical uh, from a mental health professional perspective because I'm not, I'm not helping them get from court to home and from, you know, I'm not doing the case management, the community stuff. I'm, not, I'm, I'm in the office and I'm working with them therapeutically. The mentors provide another level of support. And like you said, uh, it's a level of comfort, you know, for, for those veterans who listen and think of the first time uh, that you reported a new duty station and your squad leader was there to kind of show you the ropes and, hey, this is what's normal here. Hey, this is what's normal there. That that's really the role that the peer mentors have in the courts. Right. Then that's and that's a, um, a, a great observation. Um, what it, what I was talking about more was just the, the other participants in the program. Uh, that are similarly situated and having that camaraderie that, hey, here's another person that has gone through um, a similar experience and has found themselves in a similar experience uh, here and now uh, in criminal court. So I'm not alone from that aspect going through uh, this uh, veterans court program or this treatment program. It's just not me. There are other people like me. But certainly you're right. Uh, there are the, the peer mentors that are there for the courts that utilize them. Uh, it, they, they're extremely vital and important part of the experience. And you don't, you don't have that uh, of the same ilk in the other courts, like a, a domestic violence court or a DUI court. You have the service providers, uh, but you don't have those mentors. I think it's, it's extremely vital, as you mentioned. Right. And, I, and, and I've always uh, sort of heard it explain my personal mentor. I actually started out as a veteran court mentor, um, that the uh, uh, when I was getting ready to retire, I knew I was going to be a mental health professional, but I said, what else am I going to do between now and then? Uh, and I heard about this veteran court thing, and I said, I'll check it out. Um, and I started out, so I was a, actually a court mentor for about six months before I came, became a provider. Um, and, and one of the challenges for me uh, is that uh, we're, we're here in El Paso County. We have five military installations located in the, the, um, the vicinity. So we have a lot of active duty service members, and we have a lot of um, service members that get out and remain here, some of it because of their justice involvement, some of it because it's Colorado, and, and, it's, and we love it. Um, but uh, the first time I walked into court, uh, I looked over to my right, and there, sitting in orange, I saw a guy that I was deployed with in Iraq. Like if there was literally a blinking red line from the incident that occurred in Iraq to him sitting there six years later in orange and handcuffs, I was there at the beginning of that. I was the one that brought him off, him, him off the, uh, in off the fob when he saw his platoon sergeant get shot. Uh, and, and that right there, I mean, it, it really hit home for me um, that we think that once, and this is something I think that I realized very quickly when I was in the military, once someone left the military, you hope they had a good life, everything is good, but you never really thought what was going to happen after that. Um, and, and this is unfortunately what happens after that with some veterans that don't make the successful transition, they find themselves in the criminal justice system. Very well said, exactly. And, and so when you, um, when you started and you, you were working with veterans, you mentioned that it takes a certain kind of understanding 
um, uh, of the veteran culture uh, or the veteran mindset. And we, the mental health field, we call it cultural competence, uh, but it is very much the same. How did you develop some of that understanding around veteran culture? You had veteran friends, but you'd never been a veteran yourself. Um, how did you develop that to the level where you're at now? Well, uh, great question, Dwayne. Uh, some of it, and a, a lot of it actually, was on-the-job training. So having conversations with my clients, always the best source to gain an understanding of anything going on in your client's life uh, that could uh, assist you in defending them or assist you in uh, representing them uh, is to just have conversations. And, and there's no real secret sauce uh, to that other than that. I, mean, I went to, to law school. Um, I, I think there's this veneer that uh, there's some mystery uh, to uh, being being a lawyer. And really, it's about being a person. I think all the really good attorneys that I've known in my life, you're able to talk to them on a personal level. And the way that they engage you in conversation is no different than you might expect just your, your friend, a uh, close confidant. Uh, and so I started having a lot of conversations as I went and uh, was representing a lot of veterans and the uniqueness of a public de uh, defender's office um, from an experience standpoint is that you are flooded with a number of clients uh, at any given time. So there's a lot of opportunity to have a lot of conversations. So uh, immediately I was having uh, many, many, many conversations that could have taken me years to have uh, in other circumstances. Uh, so that was the first source. Um, you know, there's training that's provided through the state of California that I was sent to uh, on the legal aspects and cultural competence was definitely a part of it. Um, and I have had, I have friends that are also attorneys, defense attorneys that are veterans and, and one of whom is a, a mentor uh, at the Veterans Treatment Court. And so having conversations with them about their experience and how it relates to representing uh, a veteran. But by and large, it's trial and error uh, for me just over time, having all those hundreds of uh, conversations with clients over the years to, to get that deeper understanding. And I know that I'll, I'll never be able to say I understand, and I, and I never do say that, and I never will be able to because I didn't, I didn't walk in the shoes, but I have a quote-unquote understanding from a perspective of an advisor of what we, what we need to do and what we need to accomplish. And I think that's very important. You know, uh, some people say, well, I've never served, so I'll never figure it out or things like that. Uh, or uh, on the other end of the spectrum, people say that, you know, well, I've watched X movie and so I must know. Right. But uh, uh, but but you took the time to to develop an understanding about the veteran mindset. Uh, I, I guess I'm curious uh, to hear from you what from your eyes, what is that veteran mindset? Ha not having ever been a veteran. Um, but maybe veterans in the veterans court, what makes them unique compared to maybe other individuals in the criminal justice who haven't served? Uh, motivation. Very motivated to take action is the, the one huge uh, difference maker be between uh, veterans and anybody else that I've, I've represented in any other situation. Uh, and when that goes across to the board of, I want to motivate, I'm motivated to better myself. I'm motivated to get beyond this challenge. Um, I'm motivated. You tell me something to do. I'll be motivated to do it. Uh, I often say veteran clients uh, have always been wonderful at active military service members too, from a standpoint that they're goal oriented and they're, they're uh, task oriented. So you assign a task, you, you by and large know it can get done. If it doesn't get done, there's probably some intervening uh, thing there that is affecting them uh, that they don't have control over. But it's not from a lack of motivation. No, I, I really like that. And, and as I'm thinking, I, I agree. You know, and, and a lot of the veterans, it's once they once they find themselves in front of the court uh, and they hit rock bottom, so to speak. Uh, what can I do to bounce up and, and get back to where I was before? Um, and, and that can help with, uh, or that can be helped with the supportive nature of, you know, not, 
not enabling them, not giving them, you know, hey, well, of course you committed a crime. You're a combat vet, right? You know, not not perpetuating the stigma, but instead supporting them and uh, and and encouraging them in their motivation. So, you know, it, it's good that you saw that. Yeah, and you know, sometimes uh, it's 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 hard when you have a client who's so motivated and you can't accomplish everything that they want to accomplish. You know, they want to conquer the world that day and. It, the balance is uh, managing uh, their expectations, uh, but but not cooling off their motivation. Uh, that this is something that's going to take time, but you know, let's harness that motivation and preserve it uh, across a longer time period. Um, and so, some of that uh, is my challenge in, in working with veteran clients. Um, but the other aspect that I think that I noticed with the the with my clients, as far as the veteran experience, is um, an attitude of respect, uh, which allows them to be more open uh, to advice, uh, treatment. Uh, again, there are a lot of intervening things uh, that could affect that. But I think, by and large, there's this level of, of respect uh, for other professions, other other people, and that certainly comes from their experience that helps them, not just from an aspect, if I go to court and I'm very polite with a the judge, they're going to do right by me. Uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just, it's at this in, inherent level of understanding there's a hierarchy of authority, but I'm going to respect somebody else. And so now I'm more open to hearing things and not closed-minded. Um, I, I don't know, and I don't necessarily know exactly where that might come from. It's just an observation I've had being somebody who uh, has not served in the military. That's, a, that's a, it pretty it starts pretty quickly in basic training. If you have uh, disrespect as part of your nature, you don't last long. So it's, it's one of those things that, but I can definitely see that as well. Um, as you had mentioned before, uh, some of the judges um, uh, who preside over these courts are prior service. Uh, ours is here in El Paso County, um, the 4th Judicial District. Uh, uh, Judge David Shakes um, uh, served in Iraq for a year, um, in uh, I believe it was seven and eight a year after I did, uh, and not just flying over in helicopters. I mean, he was he was going back and forth on convoys and, and has been on Rot Irish. And, and so the veterans understand that. They know that, that this, this judge, yes, he's the judge, but he also is a combat veteran. He's a military veteran. Uh, and there is that level, I mean, a super peer kind of level. Um, but then there's times where, like, they'll stand at parade rest in front of the court uh, because it is, it's a natural thing for many veterans. And for, for a lot of veterans, it's a safe place that they go back to. I'm surrounded by peers who understand my language, who understand what I'm doing, and this is comfortable for me. And so I can see, again, how that really um, uh, falls into uh, like you said, the openness and, and really what kind of um, support that they will accept. Because it's, it's hard for veterans, and, and again, this is from my experience in the Veterans Court, it's hard for veterans to who have felt so isolated for so long to receive this support. They don't know what to do with it sometimes. Yes, and, that, and that's true, and I, I've seen that and experienced that. Um, they very appreciative uh, of the help when they receive it and are effusive in the thank yous and the gratitude, but um, they're not necessarily asking for it. And that ties back to the shame that you had mentioned earlier or the guilt that they have um, um, for whatever their circumstances were, that they uh, they're that survivor's guilt or um, the, you know, guilt over putting their family through situations uh, that – uh, prevent them from reaching out um, and initially on, on their own. I said they're motivated. Um, they're motivated when they're provided with this uh, environment in this court um, to, to thrive. Uh, but them not reaching out doesn't mean they're not motivated. It's not because they're lazy. It's other things are uh, preventing that, like the shame, like the guilt, the, the pride. The, uh, they, they don't want to uh, seek help. Um, they don't want to disadvantage anyone, put anyone out, or maybe they don't feel that they're deserving of it um, at, at all. So I, I've seen all those things. Yeah, I've got veterans that, uh, heck, I think somebody probably said it to me today, you know, I don't want to take up any more of your time because I'm sure there's another veteran that needs it more than me. 
right? And we're always trying to use our shield to cover our brother. Hey, I made it back with 10 fingers, 10 toes. I'm not the guy who needs whatever assistance you're trying to give me. Uh, and that's what I see as a mental health counselor. And I agree, that's something that uh, that, that is often, those resources that are available, um, veterans will think that there's a limited number of them. And if I take something, then another veteran out there who I love my veteran brother and sister, um, they're not going to get what I get, and I would rather them have it. You know, so it's in in in, in sometimes in many ways that can be a very honorable thing until it gets in the way of of their own personal recovery. Exactly. Well said. And you'd mentioned earlier about uh, uh, female veterans in the criminal justice system, uh, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that um, as well. Uh, we have not had as many females uh in the criminal in our in our court system the court is uh, the participants in the court are predominantly male um and and it's a challenge um in you know again whatever not to stereotype it's not that that women are not in the criminal justice system it's just that women veterans don't seem to be as represented um as 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 maybe they should be yes and that's something that's been part of uh, the conversation or conversations I've been having a, a lot of over the last um, two, uh, two years, I'd, I'd say. Um, there's been a lot of focus and attention on the needs of, of female veterans. And, and there's a, a lot of different angles you can come at this at. But, you know, my, my lens is uh, those that are in the criminal justice system. The criminal, the criminal justice involve female veterans and how we can service them better. Uh, and the reason, the number one reason why you, you don't see as many is they're they're not the, the identification of who these veterans are is is lacking. Mm -hmm. uh, veterans across the board, as we just mentioned, they're not self-identifying for reasons that they don't want to take up resources is, is one. Um, but just in general, uh, veterans, uh, whether they're in the criminal justice system or not. Uh, aren't necessarily identifying themselves uh, as veterans. Uh, and particularly, uh, female veterans aren't raising their hand and saying, hey, I'm a, I'm a veteran, um, for those same reasons why they wouldn't necessarily, but also because there isn't this information of what resources are available for them um, or what um, resources are available through the criminal justice system. And one thing that we've tried very hard in California in the last couple of years is to provide information to defendants uh, that there are, are a number of rights that they have as veterans. Um, and to, do a, uh, to get the courts to provide this information to defendants early on in the process at arraignment, we actually have a statute uh, that says that these notices should go, should go out at arraignment to uh, uh, to veterans that there are these these rights. So that will increase the ability of female veterans to say, oh, wait, wait a minute, I served, and so I have these rights that I otherwise uh, know about. You know, the, other, uh, the other issue and problem that we've encountered is that um, camaraderie, for example. It, within the like experience of being, of being a, a military service member, uh, that there they don't there are subsets of experiences and here is is one uh, that the dividing line is gender so if you're a female serving in the military your experience is different than the male serving in the military for a number of different reasons so when you're sitting if you have an opportunity to be in a court uh, you're a square peg in a round hole situation so if you might as well be in a, in a totally different court because that particular court uh, is not a court with your peers and that peer support. Um, so there's a thought of maybe creating a parallel a veterans court for female uh, veterans. Uh, of course, you need numbers, as you know how courts operate. You know everything requires uh, money and financing, so you need to have some numbers backing the, uh, the, the need to demonstrate there's this need, so we should uh, pursue this um, this option. And it, it's almost like a catch-22. If you can't identify uh, female veterans, then you, you can't say there's a real need. So uh, that, that's uh, been a, a struggle for us because they're, they're there. Uh, if you can get them to identify, you can find them. Uh, and lastly, the, 
the mental health needs of the female uh, veteran can be different than male veterans. Um, and we see that certainly with military sexual trauma. Um, if that is the uh, associating mental health disorder that's connected with their service, then they're definitely not in a, a, a right fit situation being in a court that's filled with other male service members uh, that uh, went through a combat experience or some other traumatic experience as a result of their service that might not have been non-combat, that's not uh, sexual trauma. Now, of course, there can be sexual trauma for males and, and females alike. It could be uh, female and female, male and male, all cross gender. It's just not, oh, you don't, they don't want to be in a, in a courtroom with uh, males because males were the perpetrators. They could be, it might not, might not have been. Um, and the point is, is that military sexual trauma as a condition is much, much different than somebody who's, uh, that is uh, suffering from PTSD as a result of combat. So uh, for that reason, even vet, uh, female veterans that might normally identify themselves don't even want to bother going through that because they're not going to be comfortable. They don't feel like it's, it's a, a good fit. And, you know, actually, personally, um, I've had um, only one other female veteran before this year now of uh, Interestingly enough, this year, and maybe it's just because there's been more conversation about it, Dwayne, um, I now have uh, two female veteran clients. Um, but prior to this year, it was only one. Um, it, you know, of course, statistically, there are males are there are more males in the criminal justice system anyway than than females. So you have that just overarching stat uh, as well. But I think really for the, on the veteran side, it's because it's a different experience. No, I, I really appreciate that. And I can I can see how uh, you said earlier, and, and yes, it is a very isolating experience. If a veteran um, does leave the military and they go to a community that doesn't have a lot of um, uh, military connections or things like that. Uh, so that's isolating. Uh, and then um, being a female veteran is isolating. You feel isolated from the veteran community uh, and so it, it's like different levels of isolation um, even though okay yes I'm around my brethren or things like that um, that 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 can compound the situation uh, and, and it is a challenge I mean there's always uh, like you said the 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 concern we want to provide support for uh, the women veterans um, but then how do we get them uh, what we see uh, typically how we are able to uh, alert veterans to our program is through our county jails. Um, well, uh, we, um, when we have uh, female veterans in the county jails, they bond out and then there's no follow-up. We don't have any connection to where they're at. And so um, right. they sort of go back to their situation. Uh, I see it in parallel. And, and before this, I was working in the homeless veteran population. Um, I saw it in parallel with the um, a female veteran homeless uh, situation in which um, they won't identify as a homeless veteran, you know, or they'll be couch surfing or they'll be, um, you know, in her and her children um, may be in a bad situation just to remain housed, you know. And so um, there's a lot of different challenges and unique challenges when it comes to uh, female veterans uh, just in general. And it's good to hear that you're starting to have those conversations to provide that kind of support uh, because it's necessary whether people believe it or not. Yes, and you, you touched on uh, a really unique point, uh, point, a point about the bonding out. Uh, when I said statistically there are more males in the criminal justice system than females, also statistically there are, are um, more serious crimes that males are committing or being charged with um, in the criminal justice system than females. So how that equates to bonding out is that there are more opportunities uh, just on statistically for females to bond out on a case than for males because their level of bail will be set lower by virtue of their offense not being as serious, for example. So whereas you can have uh, a lot of follow-up with inmates that remain in jail, they can't afford to post the bond because the bail set uh, too high for them financially, that, that's because the majority of them are going to be males because of the level of offenses they're being charged with. And so you can have all that follow-up. We have that here in California. We have a great system 
of jail outreach workers that um, go into the, the jails and have all these wonderful intakes and uh, pr um, provide the, the information out to uh, the public defender's office or uh, you know, even private defense bar. Uh, but once, it doesn't matter whether you're, anyone who's getting out of jail uh, is now, it's much difficult if they're not already connected to follow up with them by and large. No, and, and so then it gets to the point of if a female veteran um, does get to the point where her bail is so large, then she usually has a number of prior convictions um, or, or prior charges or, or what have you. Um, mm -hmm. And and so what we've seen, and this is really how the, the court started here in Colorado, is if we catch veterans at when they're the misdemeanor levels and when things are lower, it's we're, we're more likely to be able to have success with them. Um, and, and so it's a little counterintuitive that if someone can't bond out, then it's likely that they've already been through a couple of smaller issues and they're a little bit in the system farther down the line. Now, it, you had uh, told me before that California is doing something unique regarding that uh, with its uh, misdemeanor diversion. Yes. So we, we back in uh, 2015, the law changed and, and allowed for the creation of military diversion. And, and uh, diversion isn't uh, was not something new. There was drug diversion. There's other types of diversion programs that were there. And what that simply means is that um, instead of going through the normal course of a criminal misdemeanor case, uh, in that we have uh, your arraignment where you enter your not guilty plea and then you end up having your jury trial later and it's this adversarial system, is that we can put that on pause while you go and complete uh, this program or this sort of treatment, and if you complete it, then the, the charges and the case will be completely dismissed. That sounds very similar to Veterans Treatment Court uh, for those listeners that have been following us in this conversation. It's different in that the uh, Veterans Treatment Courts um, are much more in, in involved. Uh, there are those um, stakeholders that the, the service uh, providers that are, are um, very much involved. Diversion typically is um, a lower level of that. You don't have as, as much involvement from um, service providers um, on the diversion level. But the problem that we were seeing in California is that the courts, the veterans treatment courts were the, some of the only places in which this uh, experience could happen, that uh, experience being different than the adversarial um, experience. So a veteran would come in with a case that was a misdemeanor and had a lot of needs, uh, but they couldn't get themselves into a veterans treatment court because the veterans treatment court was filled and they were filled with other more serious cases. And while the veteran uh, was, had the same needs as his brethren that were in the program and the veterans treatment program, because by virtue of him not committing a more serious case, he wasn't able to have the benefit of um, or the ability to go through a similar program that could really benefit him. So what they, you were seeing was uh, these misdemeanor cases mounting up because the veteran wasn't getting that same experience or treatment, and it wasn't until they've reoffended and now they're bringing charge with a felony or looking at a more severe consequence. Now, now they're able to knock on the door of veterans treatment court. And of course, that wasn't the intent. Uh, that's just how things played out. So what California did was they said, okay, well, we'll create a, um, a uh, almost parallel system. It won't be, won't be all the bells and whistles of veteran treatment court, but we will focus on misdemeanors because those types of offenses you mentioned earlier, DUIs, domestic violence, um, a lot of those, uh, those are initially charged as misdemeanors, bar fights, misdemeanors. Uh, some can be uh, felonies depending on uh, the circumstances, but a lot of them are starting as misdemeanors. So if we can capture those veterans earlier um, on and provide them with a structure and services and experience, then they're going to get rehabilitated. So they created military diversion uh, courts in, in California, and uh, they've been by and large very successful since 
2015. Naturally, as with anything new, there's been um, some litigation and arguments of you know, what offenses uh, should be excluded or not, or how things are operating. And that, and we're going to flush some of that out uh, still in the years to come. But it has allowed for a wider net to be cast out to to help provide services through the criminal justice system to a, a lot of veterans and active military, because the military diversion court is for both veterans and active military service members to get those services that they need now, so that they are not escalating in their reoffense, and. As an interesting um, result is that the Veterans Treatment Court has been able to accept even more serious uh, offenses. So veterans, because uh, the, there was the other aspect um, uh, that was happening was that there were a lot of veterans that had very serious charges that weren't getting in because, again, veterans courts were filled and they had to be, uh, they had to scrutinize who they were going to uh, take in or not or they just couldn't because they were at max capacity. So you also on the other end of it had a lot of veterans that weren't getting um, services or help uh, be because their offenses were too serious. Uh, and so now it has allowed a, uh, allowed a reallocation of resources. And so veterans uh, that have felony charges, more of them are getting attention through Veterans Treatment Court in California. And there's a mechanism to really help the uh, veterans on the misdemeanor level as well. Yeah, those uh, it's it's definitely some great programs, uh, and, and it's it, it is unfortunately needed. This is one of the indicators of um, improper transition. You know, we talk about the different things. Um, you know, veteran suicide, veteran homelessness, veteran unemployment, uh, uh, justice involvement. These are all indicators of an underlying unaddressed. Um, mental health uh, condition concern or things like that. Um, it, it, this is, it, as you had mentioned earlier, this is probably something that we can talk about all afternoon um, it, just because of, of our mutual uh, admiration and passion for this. I, I never, like you perhaps, I, I never thought that I would get involved in, in veterans in the criminal justice system. Uh, you were planning on, of course, uh, being a lawyer but not in a veterans court uh, so I really appreciate you coming uh, on the show with the with the legal aspect, and and uh, uh, hopefully we can be able to continue this conversation. Just raise awareness about the benefits for veterans courts around the country. Absolutely, and I really appreciate you having me on the show. And in the future, if, if there's any other topics that you want to talk about, and in regards to military and veterans and the criminal justice system, um, I'm happy to have another conversation with you. Really appreciate the time, Dwayne. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if um, if somebody were to uh, maybe a veteran in California is looking for some uh, more information on veterans courts, uh, uh, how can they find you? How can someone reach out to you, uh, or even providers who may be interested in learning more about this? Sure. So uh, my uh, law firm's called Snyder Law, and we're located in Irvine, California. And if you're ever, if those listening are familiar in California, we're off the 405 by John Wayne Airport. Uh, you can reach us at 949-333-3702. Uh, or you can email me at Kevin, K-E-V-I-N, at SnyderLawPC.com. That's S-N-Y-D-E-R-L-A-W. P as in Paul, C as in Charlie, dot com. And happy to hear from everybody and anybody that has a, a question about uh, being military veteran criminal justice system. And I will make sure that all of that uh, is in the show notes, and hopefully we don't uh, clog the phone lines with all the phone calls you, you might get. But uh, we will definitely make sure that's there. Once again, thanks for coming on the show, Kevin. Uh, thanks again for having me, Dwayne. Have a good one. You're listening to Headspace and Timing on the Change Your POV Podcast Network. There's a couple of really great things here. First, Kevin demonstrates that you don't have to be a veteran to support veterans. We talk a lot about the gap between those who have served and those who haven't, and it's certainly there. What gives me hope, however, are folks like Kevin who step into that gap and develop an understanding about military culture and mindset and pitch in where needed. Another thing that's demonstrated in this show is that life after the military isn't always sunshine and rainbows. 
I know a lot of veterans know that, and life isn't always sunshine and rainbows, even if you haven't served. But there's a particular kind of difficulty that comes with the veteran finding themselves in situations they didn't expect. Dr. Philip Zimbardo, who developed the Stanford Prison Experiment in 1971, said this in his book, The Lucifer Effect. There are situational and systematic influences on an individual's behavior. Military service in general, and combat experience in particular, are certainly situational and systematic influences on behavior. At the same time, however, Zimbardo goes on to say, Attempting to understand the situational and systematic contributions to any individual's behavior does not excuse the person or absolve him or her from responsibility in engaging in immoral, illegal, or evil deeds. That's what veteran courts are about recognizing the situational and systematic influences on a veteran's behavior, giving them an opportunity to take responsibility for that behavior, and helping them overcome these influences and come out the other side with a greater understanding and awareness than they had before they began. I can't stress enough how critical it is to understand that just because a veteran committed a crime doesn't make them a criminal. No labels are beneficial, of course, but if we're going to try to separate the war from the warrior, we need to make sure that we separate the act from the actor. Not understanding the impact that our military service has on us and not seeking help when we need it doesn't make us criminals or broken or messed up in any way. It makes us human. Lastly, I wanted to point out that the involvement in the criminal justice system, similar to other challenging situations that veterans find themselves in, such as homelessness, chronic unemployment, and even suicide, is an indicator of an underlying problem, unaddressed mental health and wellness needs. As I often say, if we don't have stability in mental health and wellness in our post-military lives, then we run the risk of hitting some roadblocks. Sometimes those roadblocks can be pretty severe, like justice involvement. I've talked to dozens of veterans who never thought they'd see themselves in this situation, yet here they were. Programs like veteran courts help service members of all eras come back from war and get back to better. Don't forget, in the last couple months, I've been giving away free books to organizations that partner directly with veterans. July's partner is Operation TBI Freedom, a nonprofit in Colorado Springs that provides peer support and case management with veterans who have experienced traumatic brain injury. If you want to learn more about the organization, go to veteranmentalhealth.com forward slash organization. If you want to support their work with veterans, head on over to veteranmentalhealth.com forward slash combat vet book and pick up a copy. And speaking of the book, I'd like to give a shout out to my colleagues at Veterans Recovery Resources, an organization in Mobile, Alabama that's providing mental health counseling by veterans for veterans. They're putting on a peer support symposium on August 9, 2018 in Mobile, and they've picked up copies of the book to give to all attendees. You can sign up for the symposium at veteranmentalhealth.com forward slash symposium and find out the great work that they're doing at veteransrecoveryresources.org. I've also been telling you about some of the things we're doing to spread the word about veteran mental health and wellness, and we're trying to get this information to you in as many ways as we can. We've started to develop content for your Echo device, and we've got some good stuff and more on the way. You can get a daily update about veteran mental health, explore different concepts around it, and now the entire Change Your POV podcast network catalog, nearly 500 episodes, can be found on your smart speaker. There's a skill that you can use as a companion to the latest Change Your POV podcast book, Motivation Monday, Volume 1, and even a couple skills to make you think and to make you feel good. Did you know the Dalai Lama's on Twitter? And did you know there's a Twitter account that brings you the thoughts of a very good dog? It's a feel-good time and definitely a benefit to your mental health and wellness. To see them all and more to come, check out veteranmentalhealth.com forward slash skills. Finally, thanks to, this week's, thanks to this week's sponsor, Shopify. If you need to sell stuff to pay the bills like we do here at the Change Your POV Podcast Network, then Shopify will meet your needs and you can get a 14-day free trial just by signing up. You can find out more about them and all the things that help us do what we do at changeyourpov.com forward slash resources. Make sure to tune in next week when we talk to another veteran who transitioned into the mental health field after leaving the service. I have a conversation with Dr. Carl Castro from the University of Southern California. Dr. Castro was the lead author on an article identifying a series of combat veteran paradoxes. Dr. Castro and I have a discussion about the need to understand and support veterans in their mental health and wellness as they leave the military. Here's a quick preview. That's where we still struggle, you know, after all of these years of being at war and all the deployments that are our military has participated in, we still really struggle with welcoming them back into the community and supporting them with the type of support they need. Make sure you subscribe in all your podcast players of choice so you don't miss it. And until then, stay focused and be well. I'd like to thank the Change Your POV Podcast Network for hosting this show and highlighting the critical importance of veteran mental health. We want to hear from you. 
You can reach out to me via email at Dwayne at VeteranMentalHealth.com. You can find me at Twitter at The Counseling Vet or head on over to Facebook and look for the Change Your POV Squad. You can find the show notes for this episode and all the episodes by going to VeteranMentalHealth.com or ChangeYourPOV.com. Sign up for updates on either or both so you don't miss another episode. While you're at it, check out the other great shows on the Change Your POV podcast network. The show about remembering our military history and reviving our warrior spirit, changing hearts and minds. The show about outdoor activities that us veterans love so much, Neophyte in the Woods. The show that helps us get going at the beginning of the week, Motivation Monday. And Attack Fridays, the show that brings you actionable tips, tricks, and coachable knowledge to help you make the best of your transition. While you're checking out the other shows, drop us a review in iTunes or whatever podcast platform you're listening to. The reviews really help spread the word about what we're doing. If you're looking for the total package for all the information you need to live the life you want after leaving the military, you found it. If you know of a buddy who's looking for the same info, share it with them so they can find it too. I want to thank Doc Todd for his permission to use his track, Not Alone, from his amazing album, Combat Medicine. Doc Todd is somebody who's trying to bring veteran mental health out of the darkness and into the light, and you can get the album by going to therealdoctod.com. Check it out, because remember, veterans, you're not alone. Ever. The struggle is real, found a piece and lost a soul. Eventually my drinking, it got out of control. There in darkness, I roam, struggling to find home. See, suddenly death didn't feel so alone. 22 a day, destination unknown. It could have been avoided if you picked up the phone. But now you're gone, so I guess all we get is the tone. Nothing but bone weeds, overgrown, pushing up stones. I've triumphed over enemies, co-creating enemies. Broke out facilities that tried to put an end to me. R.I.P., I'd rather grind in tranquility. Authentic Tennessee, embrace my ability. from your forehead it's time man you've been through enough pain stand up it's time to stand back up all my veterans man army marine corps navy air force coast guard get up you know 